Ooh, you see that? Yeah, that's the only signal I can see from the surface. Um, you see that? And that? And yeah, see that shadow? That's a sheath within a sheath, but it's chubby. This is the growth from earlier this season, so three growths this year. Dried up, sheath within a sheath, it's chubby. And this is the little straggler growth. So basically these two grew at the same time, but didn't exactly synchronize in their growth until very recently. So this sheath is also chubby, I think, but you know, a little bit further behind. And this is Cattleya Maxima. Am I nervous? Yes. Why? Because it's my crown jewel orchid. And yeah, I've done this hundreds and hundreds of times. So I'm just going to go into my Zen mode. Let's see if we've got bubbles. This will be the pre-soak. I've got some fertilizer in here. We've had seaweed. We don't have bubbles. And that tells me it's going to be one of those. And if I have to, I will be here with the headlamps on because this one I'm quite cautious about. I'm speculating on a division from the back, but we shall see once we get in there. Oh, here we go. All right. Welcome to the rejuvenation of Cattleya Maxima. I will do my best to keep chatting. Thank you so much for joining me. I really appreciate it. And uh, as I mentioned before, I am a little bit apprehensive, but uh, that is not because I don't think I know what I'm doing. It's just because my favorite orchid is right in front of me. So the criteria that match and tick the box for this health check, rejuvenation, possible rhizome cut, two years in the pot. There is no give, no bubbling, no gargling. There's a lot going on in the pot. New roots are growing and the pot is relatively hard. Not much. But that could be also because some roots have died. But it's relatively hard, mainly around the front. So it fits the bill, it fits the criteria, and that is why I'm doing it now, even though it is pushing buds, because I can feel them. I can feel them. And I'm gonna give this my due diligence just as much as I give all my orchids. I'm going to dig deep, tap into the resources of knowledge that I have of every repot I have filmed so far and just do what I normally do with any other orchid that I've worked with. And I'm just going to pretend that this is not my maxima and just do what I always do because that has worked out well. Now she feels quite pot bound, but she's not. Yay! Thank you. Thank you. I like it. So we'll just loosen off the top and let's see if we were right. So we've got some great root growth down here. And I shall just start to dislodge all the lecker, which is coming off relatively easy. Tells me that there's dead roots in the bottom. Yep, here we go. You can see all the mush. This is going to be a complete revamp. And also, I don't feel as hesitant about 
this one not blooming. It's going to probably prove me wrong just because I'm getting ahead of myself. But uh, many, many, many of the orchids that I have filmed in sheath are in actual fact pushing buds inside those sheaths. So this is just as well going to do the same thing. And if not, and I know I've done the right thing for this orchid this time of year. And you can see why I was so desperate to get in here, simply because two years, roots do die. Especially species, cattleyas will dump their roots. And I needed to make sure that this isn't going to be a toxic environment for the next 12 months. And for that reason, yay, I'm actually getting around to it. There will be collateral damage. Happens all the time. But if I can maintain most, like, two-thirds of the root ball, then that's going to be just perfect as well. Very, very little bit of a dirty business going to go on while I do the cleanup. But in the meantime, I am very relieved to be able to actually get going on this orchid. It's going to be so much better for it. I'm going to feel so much better to be able to get in and clean up. In a long time waiting to do this. And isn't it strange? I'm not saying this is the last of my little repots that I have to do because orchids are how they are and you have to react and respond sometimes regardless of time of year. But isn't it strange that after all these repottings, saving the best for last, the best of my orchid collection, which is not fair to all the others. I agree, I admit, I recognize that. But if I were to walk away with one orchid and one orchid only, if somebody said that's all you can take, it would be this one. So if you've seen my other videos, there is a playlist, everything semi-hydro. There's a lot of my repots just listed in that. That is where I'm doing what I'm doing now, working my way around, finding the dead, going up as far as I can, getting that out because it will make my life easier. And if something has branched, it comes off. If it's dead to where the green part of the root is, and if something is completely dead, I don't go all the way up until I haven't worked my way up the root ball. I find my way bit by bit into the network, thus releasing more of the LECA and getting into what is relevant. There's the first part of the rhizome. And uh, I had two microfibers in here right at the beginning. She was weak when she was first potted up. Very, very weak division. I can see from class and orchidean. Horrified when I arrived. And thanks to Rick L. And his amazing, invaluable information. She bloomed on two growths within 15 months. And that is all due to Rick L. I owe him for the life support line and his information, I owe him the life of my Maxima. So let's see. I will just keep rolling the film. I will definitely put in timestamps. Being that this is my favorite orchid, I want to document every step as best as I can. And I know that people will be very, very happy to know that there are timestamps and others will be just wanting to sit back and watch as I clean this gorgeous, gorgeous orchid up. I have the next size up pot ready. If I'm not going to do a rhizome cut, um, <clears throat> I have a much bigger pot available as well. I didn't bring that out. Because in my mind, I'm going to split her. In my mind. 
So if you are new to my channel and you haven't seen any other videos of mine, you might be wondering why I prize this orchid so, so much. Well, my son's name is Maximilian. This is Maxima. My son was a professional golfer. One of his signature colors was gray and hot pink. And yes, he wore those colors really well before anybody even caught on that a guy can actually look really good in those colors. And luckily, I got the hot pink version. No guarantees sometimes when you get a Maxima what color will be yours, but here she is, hot pink. And that is why this is Maxima. If I could name this one ever at a show, the name I would choose for this orchid would be Champion. And that would be X A M P E O N because my son was a champion. And it is a hybrid of champion, obviously, in English, and champion, Spanish, more in the Basque area with an X that is pronounced like a CH. Champion. But I don't think I will ever be going to a show in order to accomplish naming her. And in some videos, if you stick around in my channel, that would be really nice. Thank you. In some videos, I refer to this orchid as he. That is subconscious. For some reason, my orchids, I normally refer to them as feminines. I don't know why, just the way it is. But if you hear me every once in a while saying he, then that is because of my son. And I think a lot about him when it is time to deal with this orchid, when I soak it, water it, take care of it. He is always on my mind. Same with other orchids. This collection basically came because of therapeutic reasons. I've been growing orchids for many, many years, but on and off, I grew in the tropics. Then I started growing in pots and clay pots and bark, and always these Cattleya types, mainly, mainly because we don't have that much of a selection, Cattleya and Phalaenopsis here in Spain, we don't have the variety that I would have gotten into from where I was growing before in Kenya. And then I had to give up that collection because of life. And I was prepared to make a compromise because somebody was not appreciative of me moving in with all my orchids. So that collection just kind of, yeah, went by the wayside. And um, after what happened, happened, I was lost, shattered, broken. And even though I speak in past tense to some degree, that is still the case. And he laid it on my heart to go back to orchids. And this orchid was one of the first I found. And because of this orchid, the majority of my collection is based around names, memories, things that remind me of good stuff, painful stuff, painful in a good way, if you know what I mean. And um, my collection is now at 300. I have specialized quite a bit in the little ones, the Rapiculus Lelias, because if life were to happen again, I can move with them. I can move with my Rapiculus, and I can take 
maxima along as well. So, Rapiculus lelius will be able to be very happy on a windowsill or on a small balcony. And Maxima will always find place, always. So there's a little bit of that nostalgia in my voice. The fact that I'm concentrating on what I'm doing is helping me keep it together because it's not a subject I can address easily. And if you haven't skipped forward, and if you're watching all of this, now you know. And I'm not a person to expose myself either. But there's one thing to be said about when you're dealing with an orchid, I always feel that sometimes it would be nice to know what makes this one so special. And I always talk about it. And sometimes my voice cracks when I'm talking about it. And although sometimes I could say, well, that's nobody's business. It's better to say it and let people be aware of it. And then I hope there's some understanding as well in this whole process. Why I'm so passionate about certain things. Why I am so adamant about certain things. Why I will defend certain things. That is not because of the ignorance or it is my way or the highway. It is because of past experiences and it's because things that mean a lot to me, they have, there's a reason. It's not just me, you know, throwing it out there and say, well, whatever. No. And it's, it's, it's not a good position sometimes to be in, in life, when you are so opinionated or so stuck in your ways. But sometimes it is because of life that you become opinionated and stuck in your ways. It doesn't mean you're closed off to other opinions. It doesn't mean that what other people say doesn't count. I'm always, always encouraging dialogue. But then after considerable thought, one reverts back to what one is comfortable with or one knows to be true, then you know that is what it is for me. And that is how I'm trying to operate in this new phase in life, not to be distracted by all the flashing lights and the hoopla that can go around. Even with the orchid hobby, it happens. And um, there's so much hype. So much controversy, and I, there's no need. This is a beautiful, beautiful hobby, and it's there for everyone to enjoy and, and to be successful in, no matter how you do it. The point is to grow these beauties into something that will bloom, and how one goes about it. Isn't it marvelous that there are so many different ways and methods I mean, when I started growing, yeah, I was a little Toto Kidogo, there you go, some more Swahili, small child. I was early teens, I think, te no, 11, 12, when I got my first Catlia cut. It's in my orchid tag. And I just put them on the trees because that's how they were grown. And then I got another one and another one, and then something that looks like a Vanda cropped up. Back then, I didn't care about names. I'm not saying that I care about it now, but because I am on YouTube and there's a lot of people that know a lot more than me. And then they put it into the comments, and I am so grateful because, you know, I can just go do the classic thing and say, oh, this is what I was sold, even though this is what I wanted. I got this. Okay, whatever. It's, there's a reason why this orchid came into my life. But I do appreciate when somebody can clarify something regarding names. Oh, my goodness, that means that person has done the homework for me. I embrace it. I really, really do. In my little patio area and dining room area, I can, I've been locked in my own little orchid growing world for, with this collection for approximately three years now. And, you know, eventually, because you're doing research, the cookies come in. And suddenly you're being recommended YouTube videos, and I'm like, oh, hey, now, 
that's a new thing. Why, you know, that wasn't around a long, long time ago. <laughs> so, and then the marvel at how the different growing methods and in different climates and I was like, you know, I just grew from Kenya to southern Spain. My biggest challenge was suddenly I had to grow these gorgeous beauties that belong in a tree in the wild. I had to grow them in pots. That's when my challenge started. And my next challenge was I don't always want to be buying this bark. I was getting fed up. It was messy. It was dirty. It, I don't know, for me, for me. So I went straight into this. Lecker business because I know it from Germany back in the 80s when this was invented it was all about growing terrestrial orchids in semi-hydro even self-watering pots were already around and then I thought you know boom there was Ray Barcolo and I'm telling you that was like a light bulb moment for my hobby to see that I can do it with that because I had in my home in, in Germany all, all my orchids, I'm sorry, all my plants in semi-hydro. Palm trees, you name it, it was all in semi-hydro. I didn't want the mess on the carpets. I didn't want the smell. I didn't want the wet, the wet smell in my home. So that's when I thought, well, well, well. And then I had another problem because I couldn't get this kind of lecker in Spain yet. So I started growing just in lava rock because I saw Rick L do it and I went, oh, I got that. I can get that. So some of the old repottings that you saw on my channel is still from back in the day when I was just growing in lava rock and semi-hydro. And the lecca that we had that I use in my humidity trays now, it just floats. I mean, what is the point of that exercise? But isn't it marvelous to have the opportunity for a plant that is so diverse and grow in so many different methods? I mean, it doesn't get any better than that. I think it's marvelous. So this is just like, you know, just having a chit chat. You're here with me and I appreciate it so much. Sounds like I'm rambling and babbling and talking more than I should. But I'm just going to let Maxima inspire me to say what I want to say and let this video be a little bit of a standout of its own with a little bit of a difference to it. Because my son was that way as well. He stood out. He really did. A remarkable human being and taken far too soon, far too soon. My goodness, the world has lost, the world ha has lost because he's gone. And I'm not just saying that as a mum. I hardly left the house. Um, I didn't want to face people. We are somewhat well known in our area and it's quite um, painful to be out and about, maybe just bump into somebody when you're not prepared. I can brace myself, I can prepare myself when I have the time to do so before leaving the house for whatever reason. But it's the moments when you're out and about, you're unprepared, you don't know, and then suddenly you might see a friend, you might see a car, a friend of his, and they look. There's first the recognition of who you are, as in me, and then there's another flash in the eyes, and then I feel like I ruined their day too. And then it just it just gets awkward. It it gets awkward. I feel bad because I think I've ruined their day because they certainly weren't in that frame of mind. I feel like I am in a permanent frame of mind and I have to make an effort to, you know, be sociable and, you know, not kind of walk away. 
but you don't want to do that to other people. And when they don't expect to see you and you don't expect to see them, there's that awkward moment. And it takes me very long to, to get over that. Very long. It takes me a couple of days sometimes. So, I mean, the lockdown for me was a blessing. Now I really had an excuse to stay home. Whereas before it was like, when am I going to, when am I going to tomorrow, tomorrow? And, you know, in Spain, that means mañana, mañana. And then we know all the cliches about that. <laughs> mañana. And tomorrow never comes. So one year became two years, became three years. And then lockdown happened. And I was like, oh, I'm so glad. I'm so glad I have an excuse. So glad that I don't feel obliged to leave the house for any specific reason or that I'm limited to a time or I can't leave at all. I was, the circumstances of course around the lockdown are not pretty and I am not in any way, shape or form saying yay for the lockdown. Oh, absolutely not. It has destroyed, if, if you'd like to think of my plans of 2020, it has destroyed my plans for 2010 and I'm absolutely if I if I allow my head to go there I'm even more freaked out so I, I can't allow my head to go there but you know I, I can't say that YouTube has necessarily helped me but I can say it has helped me as well because I started to study feverishly how to work the softwares how to do this how to do that I have such a long list of search history on how to, it, it, yeah, it was <laughs> big learning curve and I'm still learning, I'm trying to get better, but lockdown for me was a relief. What do you mean? We can't leave the house? Yay! <laughs> I was the first to go, yes, simply because I was starting to get a guilty conscience about not leaving the house. So yeah. Look at that. We're just about done. Are you still with me? <laughs> I wonder how many people use the timestamps. And I'm not saying that in any negative way. They are there for a reason. My goodness. They are there for a reason. So I'm not trying to be like, e you used to time. No, 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 no. That's something, it's like a service that YouTube offers, and if you're willing to take it on, then my goodness, the fact that you clicked the video and started to even consider watching it, that's awesome for me. So what I'm doing now is trying to see if I want to make a division, if it's worth it, because if I don't see an eye, we can always say, yeah, it might trigger something. But I already have three directions of growth on this one. So I'm thinking that because he is in sheath and because I've attacked him, he is staying as he is. Let me just see if the new pot is big enough or if I have to take the big one out. Oh, I've got something very special for this orchid. You see, that would last me one year. Hmm. The thinking is deafening, isn't it? Just one year. I also have this one, which in actual fact would be perfect size-wise. I just don't like it that much, you know, because it doesn't fit flush. This is not, but maybe one day I could find an outer mask to fit flush and then just let this orchid be in this size pot. Because the other option is, look. <laughs> Don't laugh. <laughs> yeah, that's what I thought. Oh, no. Okay, but I do love this pot because it fits so beautifully flush. They don't belong together, but that other nursery. Yeah, I might. Actually, what I'm going to do is put her in here for now. 
when she's done blooming, etc., in the spring, I'm going to get another one of those pots, but a size down, the square one. It's much more elegant. There we go. That's what I'm going to do. Woohoo! I still have a third of the root ball. Let me get this out of the way. So still have a third of the root ball, which is great because it will need, he will need that in his development for the blooms. So I'm hopeful about that. And this time we're going to string up the microfiber, but leave it up into the pot like that while dangling down in the reservoir like that, just raising it up. And then I'm going to fill Lekka all the way so that the microfiber pretty much reaches halfway into the pot. Just so make sure that I'm doing it the right way, like right length as well. There we go. Now, my support that I had prepared is way too tiny. So what I'm going to do is put it in like halfway up. I don't need to make a separate support to this one just yet. It's so sturdy and so sturdy. All I need is just a little bit of a fandangle inside the pot to keep it from wobbling around. All right, let's get some lecker in. One little piece of lava rock over one hole because the holes are bigger. And if it's not filled with a microfiber, I don't want the lava rock to keep plopping out. And I'm just going to hold my microfiber up. I just keep the strands coming up along with the lecker. Isn't it funny that in other repots I had no intention of doing a rhizome cut? And here I thought I was almost like 90% sure there's, there's going to be a rhizome cut. And yet there is none. I wish now I would have measured it a bit better with the square pots because that would have been beautiful to have the square pot for Maxima. Oh well, in spring I can do this. Just an up pot. It doesn't have to be a radical cleanup. That's the beauty of inorganic. I can do just a simple up pot. So I have my support high enough to be able to accommodate helping any new growth that will need it, but not for any other reason than that. It's just, just in case. So I've veered off from the topic of what I was talking about, but that is because I'm sort of trying to explain my thought process in case it does interest anybody why I'm doing this with a Maxima and you have one of your own. And if there are any questions from before, what I was talking about, I always encourage comments below. Some questions might hurt. It might take me some time to answer, but I will answer. So I'm just keeping her right at the back again, as she was. And uh, I think we're good to go. Yeah. With lecker, with the lecker, it'll help me. Now I have this one in bright, bright shade. Sometimes in the late afternoon, it might get some direct sun, but it is always in my triple A location, the blooming alley, whether he is in bloom or not. I want to see this orchid all the time, all the time. I don't care if it's in bloom or not. Bright, bright shade. Sometimes, are you serious? You keep popping back up. Well, not for long, buddy. So bright, bright shade, and depending on the angle of the sun, some indirect sunlight late afternoon. So yeah, it's a little bit lower than I would actually like to do what I normally do. which is shake and as I push the rhizome down to give some counter reaction. Now, I want to raise it up just a little bit. And the shaking will allow the lecker to go underneath the root ball. Just 
a little bit more. Okay. Try to repeat how the orchid was before. Some roots were buried, some were not. Some of the rhizome was buried, some wasn't. These were out and about. I'd like them a little bit more contained. Maybe we can fix that. So he's been soaking for quite some time, obviously in preparation of this repot. I don't need to fill up the reservoir just now. I don't want to overdo it. Those roots were very, very wet. They are still gonna be in a very wet environment. So I'm not going, if you don't see me putting in fertilized water or anything in the reservoir, it's because of that. And was this the wire I was working with before? I think so, yeah. And that is it. My gorgeous, gorgeous Maxima. One more thing. Let's wipe down the leaves with some insecticidal soap, oil soap thing. I have been asked about this, so I'm just going to repeat it here. This is um, rapeseed oil in combination with a, gosh, parentias, I'm going to put the name up, which is a component of two kinds of chrysanthemums. And they are used for insecticides, organic insecticides, in conjunction with the rapeseed oil, which really apparently enhances those parentias or parentines or something like that. Again, I'll put it up. So um, that's what I've used here. 10 milliliters for one liter and I wipe down my leaves from the dust of the summer. This is part of my fall prep anyway with this insecticidal soap because if I'm going to wipe the leaves down anyway to get dust off and get them ready to absorb more light during the darker months of the year might as well do it with something that gives them a little bit of protection. Just in case the summer, something here has been putting out its little eggs saying, well, in due time we will hatch. Well, not on my Maxima, you will not. And let's keep our fingers crossed that we're going to see the beautiful, beautiful hot pink magenta blooms again. again. Thank you very, very much for, for watching this video. I hope that if you skip the chapters that you did get something out of what I was doing with Catlia Maxima. If you didn't skip the chapters, then you know a little bit more now. And you know what the orchid hobby means to me and why sometimes I'm super passionate about what I do and why I do it. Thank you, everybody. I really appreciate having you here. You do color my life. Have a wonderful day. Take care, stay safe, bye.